Let's look at how solid state storage works. Solid state storage is also known as flash memory. Those are pretty much synonymous terms. And uh, these are flash drives. And we are able to store zeros and ones in here. And uh, it's non-volatile, right? So we're talking about storage. And uh, this type of storage is non-volatile, which is pretty awesome. And it's pretty durable and it's pretty quick. And so the types of storage that we've been talking about you know, we've looked at magnetic storage, we've looked at optical storage, and now we're jumping down to solid state storage. And in our little diagram of computer remembering, we're over here in this area with the secondary storage, where we're learning about the different categories of secondary storage. And really in computers, it all comes down to zeros and ones. We saw that with the five generations of computers where vacuum tubes or the technology used to remember zeros and ones, and then transistors became the technology to remember zeros and ones. And then chips were, cre were created where we were able to have circuits on these chips integrated into the chips, integrated circuits, right? And uh, those integrated circuits, chips, again, those are kind of synonymous terms on silicon wafers, right? Those, uh, those were the, that, was, that is the technology that's used to remember zeros and ones today. So it's all about remembering zeros and ones. And uh, in this week, when we're looking at storage, the next category we're looking at is how do we remember zeros and ones? using flash technology or solid state technology. So we've learned a little bit about how magnetic storage works and how optical storage works. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a little insight into how solid state storage works. And this is not, let me just preface this, this is not my area of expertise. I did not get a electrical engineering degree when I went through school, nor have I studied it much. And uh, But I did a little research this morning and I've learned a few things, so I'm gonna try to pass on to you uh, what I've learned, but don't take it as a definitive source uh, or you know, as like, hey, this is, this is the way it is. I mean, this is my understanding of it from spending the morning reading about it. And uh, yeah, so uh, just a little caveat there <laughs> because uh, I am not an electrical engineer. And uh, yeah, but I read some cool stuff about it this morning. So let me try to convey some of that. So to understand solid state storage or flash memory, we kind of have to step back and first look at transistors. And transistors, if you look at that word, it's really kind of a combination of transmit and resist. So if it all comes down to zeros and ones, right? It all comes down to zeros and ones. Is there some way that we can create a device that can either transmit electricity, so electricity is able to flow through the device, or it's able to resist electricity, so electricity can't flow through the device. And so with the light switch, hey, if electricity is flowing through the device, we see the light switch is on. And if electricity is not flowing through the device, we see that the light switch is off. Well, you know, eliminate the light bulb from that equation. And is there some, some way we could just see, hey, is electricity flowing through? or is the electricity not flowing through? So the electricity is getting transmitted through the device, through the circuit, or electricity is being resisted, the circuit's resisting the electricity and electricity is not coming through the circuit. And if we can do that, if we can create that kind of a device, then we'll be able to uh, have, you know, the electricity coming through mean maybe one on, and uh, electricity not coming through mean zero off. And so that's our goal, is we want to be able to create a device, and it's already been created, but we're going to kind of come at it as if we're creating it, where electricity can either be transmitted or resisted. And uh, that's known as a transistor. And transistors, again, as we learned in an earlier week, transistors, you know, circuits, uh, integrated circuits, chips, you know, these, these words can be used a little bit uh, synonymously. Um, so an important thing to know when trying to understand this entire process is that electricity is the flow of electrons and that electrons are negatively charged particles and atoms. So I was not a chemistry guy in school, nor was I a physics guy. So I just actually went and watched this video right here, how electrons become electricity. <laughs> and it was kind of cool. It looked like it was geared towards about fourth graders. It was only a minute and a half long, <laughs> but it reaffirmed to me some of the stuff that I was learning this morning. So, you know, check it out if you want to know a little bit more about how electrons become electricity. But need to know electricity is the flow of electrons, and electrons are negatively charged particles and atoms. So our goal is to create that electronic device that either lets electricity through or uh, stops it. And uh, we're going to use a material. We're going to use semiconductor material called silicon. And why is it important that it's a semiconductor? Because it's neither conducting the electricity, just meaning it lets it all the way through, nor is it completely resisting the electricity, meaning it doesn't let it through at all. 
it has a property where it's kind of like right in the middle. It doesn't really conduct it and it doesn't really insulate it. It's just kind of like right in the middle. And that's an important property for silicon because it's going to allow us to create this device where electricity will sometimes be able to flow through it. And at other times, electricity won't be able to throw, flow through it. And so uh, silicon is neither a conductor, and a conductor is something that lets electricity flow through, like metal, like copper, uh, nor is silicon an insulator. Uh, and an insulator is something that stops electricity flowing, like plastic or rubber. So silicon's right in the middle. It is a semiconductor. And, you know, what they could do with silicon to get it to, you know, help, you know, create this device where electricity can flow through it sometimes and not at other times is they dope it, right? They call it silicon doping. And silicon doping, to do that, they add substances and chemicals to the silicon, and they could create two different types of silicon. They could create a negatively charged silicon called n-type, so it has a negative charge, and they could create a positively charged silicon called p-type, and uh, that has a positive charge. So to create the n-type silicon, they add this stuff right here. You can just read it. And what that does is it gives extra electrons to the silicon. And, uh, and electrons have a negative charge, so this will all have a negative charge, and that's why we call it n-type. So n-type has extra electrons, and it's got a negative charge. Now with p-type, they add this crap right here, and then p-type, what happens is it loses electrons. The silicon loses electrons, and when there's a loss of electrons, it's the same thing as a positive charge. So we've got a negative-type silicon and a positive-type silicon that come from this silicon doping. And with those two different types of silicons, we could create silicon sandwiches. And silicon sandwiches uh, are basically those two different types, positive p-type and n-type silicon brought together. And when we bring them together, some interesting things can happen electronically. And so here's an image of like n-type silicon and p-type silicon right here. And this area right here where they overlap is called the junction. And this basically becomes normal silicon. So whereas this has a negative charge and this has a positive charge, this just goes back to neutral, right? So it's, uh, it's not charged one way or the other. And this junction is also known as the depletion zone because the junction doesn't conduct electricity. It's just normal silicon. It's called the depletion zone because it contains no free electrons, nor is it missing electrons. So in my mind's eye, after reading about this this morning, the way I see it is it's kind of like a little bit of a, a low wall, a low wall between these two areas. And uh, it prevents, you know, any of the electrons from flowing from one side to the other. And the question becomes, is there a way that we can get these electrons to flow from one side to the other and uh, basically have, you know, the electrons leap over that wall? Because if the electrons are flowing from one side to the other, that means we have electricity, because electricity is the flow of electrons. Electricity is the flow of electrons. And so right now we got a little barrier between them, and there's no, you know, no flow between these two. Electrons are flowing, but can we get these electrons to start to flow? So the way we do that is we add a little bit of electrical current. And when we add the electrical current, you know, uh, something that's important to remember is it's just kind of like, uh, you know, that old adage in dating that opposites attract, right? Opposite charges attract, and like charges repel. So if we add a positive charge like this, so the battery's connected here, and this is a positive charge to this side and a negative charge to this side, well, if opposites attract, we have this positive charge kind of pulling over to the negative, and we have this negative charge pulling over to the positive, and so that really isn't pushing these electrons over that little wall. However, if we reverse the battery and we have a flow of electricity with a positive charge going here, and we have a flow of electricity with a negative charge going here, uh, like charges repel. So this is the negative n-type silicon, and the, you know, it's got a negative charge, and we have a negative charge here. Like charges are repelling, so these electrons are getting pushed away from this negative charge, and these positive ones are getting pushed away from the positive charge. Likewise, this positive is pulling the negative electrons this way, and, uh, you know, with that, these, these electrons are able to kind of cross this no man's land junction depletion zone, right? This little wall, I like to think of it. It's not an actual physical wall, but I like to think of it kind of like a little rock wall between two pieces of property. Uh, you know, with these, this electrical current, these electrons are able to kind of make it over this no man's land junction where it's just kind of a semiconductor. 
and uh, they're able to cross. And we now have a flow of electrons crossing over from one side of this silicon sandwich to the other. And when we have a flow of electrons crossing over, we have, uh, you know, electricity. We have electricity moving across. So our goal was to create a device where electricity would sometimes flow across, electrons would sometimes flow through. We'd have, okay, now we have that switch is on, right? We have a current electricity coming through, and sometimes they wouldn't flow across. And so with using silicon and its semiconductor properties, we were able to do that. When a little electricity is applied, we could get those, that, that current to flow across. Um, so, you know, this is actually the basic diagram for a diode. Again, I just learned this morning. So it's a light emitting diode, as in LED, and uh, and this is taking us on our way to understanding, you know, transistors uh, as they're built today onto chips and integrated circuits. But this is the first step right here, and uh, we've understood what a silicon sandwich is. We've understood that there's this no man's land, this junction area right here, and um, and you know, and interestingly, this is what an LED is, as in light emitting diode. And, uh, and what happens is that when these electrons jump across right here, they could do something somehow where it then allows it to emit light. And that light comes out as photons. And the way I read about it today, you know, was when that happens. The way they explain that is right here where they have, right, sooner or later after an electron moves from the n-type to the p-type, it will combine with the hole and disappear. So over here, this lack of electrons is known as a hole. That makes an atom complete and more stable, and it gives off a little burst of energy, a kind of sigh of relief in the form of a tiny packet or photon of light. And so, you know, wow, that's kind of amazing. Not totally sure how that works, but that's, uh, that's how we get LEDs. You know, the, the atom feels uh, complete <laughs> and uh, gives off a little burst of energy, kind of interesting. So that's uh, that's how we get LEDs. Uh, so let's continue building our silicon sandwiches. You know, this is the silicon sandwich. These are the silicon sandwiches we've looked at already, where we just had an n-type and a p-type. But what if we were to create a silicon sandwich like this, where we had an n-type, a p-type, and an n-type together? Aha! Uh -huh, that's a different looking sandwich. That's a Dagwich sandwich. And so with this type of a, a silicon sandwich, it's known as an NPN transistor, an NPN transistor. And there are also PNP transistors where basically this setup is flipped. And I have no idea what the advantages and disadvantages of the two different types would be. But what I've read about this morning are the NPN types and that they're pretty dang similar. But it's the same concept, right? We have a negative, positive, negative uh, type of silicon sandwich. And then what happens if we add electricity to this type of a silicon sandwich where we have the negative, positive, negative. So if we connect a little, few little wires here and we add some charges to these wires, what's going to happen? So the question for me is, can we put electricity through this line? Because our goal was to create an electronic device, a little device where sometimes electricity would go through and sometimes it wouldn't. And uh, the question is, is, do electrons flow through this line from left to right? So when we add a positive charge right here and a negative charge right here and a positive charge right here, what happens is, yes, indeed, the electrons are able to cross this larger no man's land here where there's the p-type in the middle, and we do get a current going across. And so, uh, you know, so that's a, a NPN transistor and how it works. And you add these little currents, and you get to get the electrons or electricity flowing through it. So, you know, this is a, actually known as a bipolar silicon sandwich or transistor because it requires, you know, two uh, polarities of electricity need to make it work. You need your positive and you need your negative. But then there's this other type of transistor known as a unipolar transistor where only one charge is needed to be applied. So here, notice the difference between these two diagrams. You know, here, if we apply the positive charge right there, if we apply the positive charge right there, what happens is that allows the electrons to flow across this gate and go from one side to the other. So here we only have to apply one charge, and that's known as a unipolar, right? We're only applying one charge. And this is actually the diagram I've seen for, you know, uh, transistors built into integrated circuits, chips, silicon wafers, and this concept of having a gate where when a charge is applied to that gate, electrons can flow through, and if there's no charge, they can't. That's our on-off state. 
and that's how we store on-off states in chips, silicon wafers, integrated circuits today, right, by uh, doing that. And this is actually known as the MOSFET transistor. So uh, MOSFET stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor, which is a big whole lot of mouthful of words, and you do not need to know that. Now, finally, we're getting to solid state storage, the entire thing we wanted to learn about. And I know you're probably like, wow, this is crazy, a little bit overwhelming. And you're absolutely right. That's how I felt when I read it about it for about four hours this morning. But hey, you're being exposed to some new concepts and terms. And maybe if you are a chemistry, physics kind of person, you are uh, going, okay, 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 that's making sense. That's making sense. And uh, so if we take this normal type of MOSFET you know, transistor right here, and we add one more gate to it, one more gate called the floating gate. So it's not just one gate, the control gate, like this would be the control gate on this one. If we had one more gate in addition to the control gate, and it's called the floating gate, the second gate, we now have solid state storage, which is what is in flash drives. And uh, this solid state storage allows zeros and ones to be remembered even when no electricity is uh, continually being applied to it. How does that happen? Well, when electricity is applied to it, some electrons get pulled up into this floating gate, and then when electricity goes off, those electrons stay there. They stay there. And so if the electrons are there, it can mean one thing, and if they're not there, it can mean something else. So it's all pretty mind-blowing, mind-boggling, pretty amazing that people have actually thought about this and figured it all out. But it all really comes down to this concept of positive and negative charges, and can we create some sort of an electronic device you know, which will allow electricity to flow through sometimes electrons moving from one side to the other and not at other times. And the material we use to do that is silicon because silicon, you know, is a semiconductor and sometimes things can flow through it and sometimes they can't. So with a little, you know, adjusting and manipulating and creating our silicon sandwiches, we're able to use silicon to sometimes allow uh, electrons or electricity to cross over this threshold here, right? And at other times to not do it. And with with uh, you know these control gates, so this this diagram right here is really just a little bit more of a complex diagram than this one, which is okay. I got that a little rock wall barrier hurdle to get over. But uh, that diagram is just a little bit more complex than that. It's the same concept where we have our PNP kind of sandwich, and uh, and can we get the electrons to flow through there with a little charge applied right there? We can. And then this, this diagram here, just a little bit more complex, one step up. And it's basically got two gates where a few electrons get stuck, so to speak. And that remembers the zero and the one uh, state. So a whole, whole lot of terminology there. Eh, not so much terminology, really. But a, a brand new concept, probably. At least it was for me. And a new way of thinking about it. And I got a lot of this information from explainthatstuff.com. So, uh, you know, you could go check that out. And I also found this cool thing on how stuff works here. I don't know, if, you know, if I stop and look at it for a couple of minutes, I can understand what's going on. But uh, that's a diagram of it right there. And finally, last thing I'll point you towards in understanding solid state storage or flash memory is, of course, Wikipedia. And uh, this little in article right at the beginning was kind of interesting to read about because it talked about a lot of things we've already been learning in this class. And you'll recognize some of the phrases in there. Uh, if you take a moment or two to go read this. All right, so I hope that tells you a little bit more about solid state storage. And, uh, you know, the goal isn't for you to be an expert in creating your own, you know, solid state storage transistors and understanding it in, in its entirety. But instead, the goal is just to expose you to this concept of sometimes electricity flows through, sometimes it doesn't. And silicon's a semiconductor, and that semiconductor you know, uh, the property of being a semiconductor is important because sometimes it'll let electricity through and sometimes it won't. And we could actually dope the silicon so it's a positive charge silicon or a negative charge silicon. And then when we create our silicon sandwiches, you know, we could uh, start to build that device where sometimes electricity flows through it and sometimes it doesn't. And if we apply a little current in just the right way, a little electrical current in just the right way, then it could facilitate the flowing of electricity of electrons going through that device. And if there's no current, then okay, it doesn't. So now we're starting to be able to do our zeros and ones, uh, just like a light switch on or off. And then finally, you know, if we uh, just add this one extra little floating gate where we get tunneling of electrons through this little barrier, the electrons get stuck. And then we're able to have non-volatile 
meaning when the power goes out, it remembers the zeros and ones. We have non-volatile -vol solid state storage. And uh, that's really what we're looking at this week is uh, storage and the three different categories of storage. And that, that, my friends, that, my friends, is solid state storage. All right. <laughs>